listen, I think it's perfectly reasonable to send Mike Flanagan an invoice for the therapy I now need after watching this show. I would still watch it again, though. Hello, Internet. It's that time of year again when Mike Flanagan scares and traumatizes us, and he's delivered once more with the fall of the House of Usher. Like Bly Manor and Hill House before it, this show consumed and destroyed me. This is a mostly spoiler-free review, but I'll be coming back to the series again because I have a lot more to say about it, so look out for more videos. I love Mike Flanagan's work. I originally discovered his movies, first with Hush, Oculus, and Before I Wake, but I was blown away by The Haunting of Hill House in 2018, and I've gobbled up every series he's released since. Flanagan's horror has always felt unique because it always comes with a sense of emotional depth contrasted with a certain level of tenderness. Even the ones that are less universally acclaimed, like The Midnight Club and Midnight Mass, still provide amazing scares and beautiful moments that make you feel things. Flanagan's series often draw literary inspiration from a large cross-section of an author's body of work when he does an adaptation. As a Poe fan since I was a teen and my username on VampireFreaks.com was Whispered Word Lenore, I was incredibly excited for the fall of the House of Usher. So let's talk about it. This series is a medley of Poe's short stories and poetry woven into the narrative of the titular Usher family. Although I was unsure what to expect because there's really not a lot to the original short story, and I doubted it could sustain an entire series by itself, this modern reimagining creates sort of an Edgar Allan Poe anthology using the story as a framework that all the other stories branch off of and return to. The writers use Poe's vagueness about the Ushers in the story as a jumping off point to flesh out the House of Usher beyond the two siblings we meet in the short story. It creates higher stakes and shows us just how far the House of Usher falls. Sometimes it really is Mike Flanagan's best work, but it's also the most uneven of his series so far, often treading into an irreverent tone closer to horror comedy with lots of jokes and silly bits. Do you know how many attorneys they brought? Seven. Six. Okay, they brought six. Do you know how many we brought? One, because Arthur has the power of six or seven attorneys. With mixed results. Sometimes it really works. That looked normal. Well, I'm a little surprised you put him in the tub. Other times it falls flat and takes the whole scene down with it. Hear him and he asked me how I was enjoying the pills and I was like, I literally fucking love the pills. And he said he was the one that invented them. And I said that I was just so grateful I could just blow them and... Yeah. We weave between two main storylines, flashbacks leading up to a New Year's party welcoming 1980, and the fates of each of the Usher children in 2023 and aftermath thereof. Although it isn't the focus of the story, Flanagan still manages to incorporate a classic haunted house, Roderick's run-down childhood home where he regales his former friend and current adversary, C. August Dupin. Dupin is a prosecutor who's been trying to get a charge to stick to the Ushers and their company for decades. The scenes in The Haunted House are some of the most effective in the series in terms of the horror and the spooky atmosphere really complements the gothic sensibilities of Poe's work, while creating visual contrast between the framing device and the main narrative. Side note, Dupin is named for the detective in Poe's story Murders in the Rue Morgue. All the character names in the stories are drawn from Poe's work, except for a few drawn from his actual life, such as Roderick's mother Eliza, named after Edgar Allan Poe's mother, and both of the former Fortunato CEOs, Mr. Longfellow and Rufus Griswold. The magnetic chemistry and skill of both Carl Lumley and Bruce Greenwood in their performances as Roderick Usher and August Dupin make their scene some of the best. Why are we talking about your mother? Because she's here. What do you mean? She's right behind you. I'm not going to turn around, Roderick. It's wild because Bruce Greenwood wasn't even the first choice for the role. They had to do reshoots for all of his scenes but he flawlessly captures the glib, defensive, self-aggrandizing con man that is Roderick Usher. Or if they're dead. Don't be naive. I, I'm not responsible. If people abuse Ligaton, this is an old and boring argument. Dupin, as played by Carl Lumley, is a perfect foil to him. You knew the extended release formulation created abuse potential. You knew it. You marketed it non-addictive anyway because you wanted more than the hundreds of millions you were pulling. That wasn't enough for you, so that's my question. Was it ever going to be enough? He's a good man who also wants to change the world. This world needs changing. You already know your resolutions, don't you? We're going to change the world. But he has a very different way of going about it than Roderick does. And honestly, I'm a bit miffed that Flanagan made me like a prosecutor this much, because Dupin really feels like a person who cares about justice in a deep and sincere way. In 40 years, not one thing, not one indictment, not one charge, not one consequence has stuck! But hey, it's fiction. 
The rest of the cast is also amazing, with a host of Flaniverse regulars. One of my favorites is Carla Gugino as Verna. Bye now, pay later. I say, I'm Verna. And I'll leave the anagram to you. She's a revelation as the mystery woman who appears throughout both main storylines and seems to have a particular affinity for sinister animal facts. You know, it was the Greeks who started it. Fourth century BCE. First experiments on animals, at least documented. Pigs and goats. Like seriously, she does it again and again. Cats are actually apex predators, you know? It's all about hunting. They can lengthen their spines for short bursts of speed, 30 miles an hour. Like by the time she's rattling off stuff about horses, I actually laughed out loud because it's so oddly specific. Do you know the term operant conditioning? It's what a horse has that lets them know a rider might be nervous or hesitant. But I love it. She has some of the funniest lines and delivers them perfectly as well. What's a six letter word for fucked? Fucked. There's also Henry Thomas as Frederick Usher, the eldest and worst of the Usher kids. Okay, so a mole is like Leonardo DiCaprio in The Departed, and an informant is like Jack Nicholson in The Departed. It's just their other movies now. He's a spineless suck up with an inferiority complex that escalates hideously. Freddie, marrying this woman might be the one thing you didn't fuck up. Well, we have that in common then, Dad. We're both lucky men. Henry Thomas is in most of Flanagan's series. He's an absolute chameleon and seamlessly slips into any role that Flanagan throws at him like magic. And he is superb here, even though I loathe Freddy. Samantha Sloyan is phenomenal as the eldest Usher daughter, Tamer Lane. You warm up Built Nation, you keep those 10 million subscribers all frothy for me. You know Blippi has 12 million? Fuck Blippi. She's been in a ton of Flanagan's work too, and is always a joy to watch. I think her performance is the most impactful of the Usher children. Her character is just so strange, but she plays it with a sincerity that still makes her relatable and easy to empathize with. Like, you still kind of just want things to work out for Tamerlane. Kate Siegel plays Camille. She might be my favorite of the Ushers overall. She's amazing in the role and so incredibly fun to watch. The family's fucked. You're the front line of my PR campaign and you just took an edible? You want some? I mean, yeah, I want some. She's also Flanagan's wife and he casts her in everything, but it's not just nepotism because she's brilliant. It is cute though. Camille has some of the best lines. And also she graces your palm as she walks by with her drippy Birkin bag full of monkey bits. And her delivery is always flawless. That, talk to lab types, bribe, threaten, mix and match. I'm just sad we don't get to see more of her. Tania Miller is also great as Victorine, but I just don't love the writing for a lot of the stuff with Vic. I feel similarly about Rahu Kohli as Leo Usher and Ruth Codd as Roderick's wife Juno. I did, however, really enjoy Saryan Sapkota as Prospero. How dare you? I'm your brother's wife. Yeah. And yeah, that's pretty fucking hot. The youngest Usher sibling. He captures a reckless young man desperate for approval and acclaim so well, and you almost feel bad for him, even though he's a walking disaster. Katie Parker as Roderick's wife, Annabelle, is heartbreaking. Igby Rigney and Aya Furukawa as Camille's assistants, Toby and Beth, aka Tina, are great. Isn't Tina, you know that my name is Beth. Oh, damn it! Toby and Tina makes me laugh so at work, you're fucking Tina! This little Poe reference also made me smile. Damn it, Toby. Toby, damn it. Crystal Bullent as Morella Usher is wonderful, but harrowing. I will offer the slight spoiler that Maury gets as happy an ending as she can reasonably expect under the circumstances, but what her character goes through is a lot and very hard to watch. Some of the newcomers to the Flaniverse also blew me away, like the legend Mark Hamill himself as Arthur Gordon Pym. He embodies the gruff, bulldog-like attorney and fixer for the Usher family perfectly. What is happening? We need to talk because when people ask, there are some things you absolutely cannot say. To the point I didn't recognize him until I looked up the cast. He's great in every scene and an absolute delight to watch. Enhance. That also isn't really a thing. Well, you can't enhance this image. You see it all the time on TV. They, they hit a button, it enhances it. You can zoom in, but that doesn't actually enhance it. Willa Fitzgerald captivates as the young version of Madeline Usher. I made myself their favorite. Kept telling Mrs. Muldoon how hard she had it. I don't know how you do it all. Even suggested ways that she could cut more corners. She started to see me as a helper. And pretty soon, she didn't even cover that ledger when I came into the room. She and Mary McDonnell, who plays the mature version of the character, both have remarkable charisma that makes Madeline quite likable despite being a terrible person. Out of the will, on the streets. Neutralized. Like dead. When I find out who's been talking to the government, to the goddamn government against your own blood, there won't be enough of you left to sue. 
But Fitzgerald in particular gives her this grit and tenacity that makes me kind of root for her, even when I definitely don't want to. What do we do now? We wait here. Drink, but don't get drunk. Talk, but don't talk. If the cops aren't here by midnight, that's a good sign. I may also like her a bit just to be contrary because she kind of has the evil girl boss TM trope going on. And it irks me how it's contrasted with Annabelle, the idyllic stay-at-home mom. Of course, we can't forget Malcolm Goodwin as the young version of Dupin. He's marvelous and brings this earnest but determined quality to him. Please, just hear me out. I'm not after you. I just want to get to the bottom of some things, set some things right, please. He's an absolute scene stealer every moment he's on screen. I also just love how observant and incisive the character is. There are so many good moments that come from the little details that Dupin picks up on. I see those homemade toys. Someone knit those dolls, carved that train. You guys go hand to mouth, just like me. Kylie Curran is also really great as Lenore, Roderick's only granddaughter. If someone really broke the law, shouldn't they be punished? Lenore, that is a brave and thoughtful thing to say. Especially if you want to get written out of the will. And I'm sure her name isn't foreshadowing for anything. <laughs> it's fine. Incredible cast aside, the writing also deserves credit where due, because for the most part, it's really solid. The ushers spend a lot of time justifying and rationalizing their actions to themselves, each other, anyone who will listen. It's a street engineer derivative of Ligodone, your drug. Well, this is what I'm saying. This happens all the time. Amateur chemists take a run at a quality, FDA-approved drug. And they're so practiced and slick about it that we find ourselves being taken in, too. Most people go their whole wasted, stupid lives without one minute of true resolution. Not me, though. And not Madeline. There's also just so much time spent on showing the amount of denial that the characters have. It was an accident. Uh, this was an accident, you hear me? And the lengths that they will go to to avoid even feeling a sense of accountability. You know, Ligodon, it's a lot of things to a lot of people. I'm just as much a victim of it as anybody else. There are also thoughtful themes surrounding the descent into madness, the effects of guilt, and the mind of guilt is full of scorpions. And I wouldn't wish their sting on anyone. And of course, consequences. Want to start a tab? Buy now, pay later. What I say. There's also explicit criticism of the rich and the evil things they will do for money, no matter how much of it they already have. If you take all of it, all the greed, the foulness, the rot in the world, and sit down across from it, what would you say? Was it ever going to be enough? And I do think that works really well. But that also might just be because I'm a filthy eat the rich leftist. The scoring and soundtrack for this show are also perfect. It's time. And they add so much character and atmosphere to the story as it unfolds. I also really loved the little things in the set design and costuming, from various visual Poe references to the way the aesthetics characterize all of the major players. It shows a level of craftsmanship and attention to detail that we've come to expect from Mike Flanagan's productions. Each of the Usher children's homes, for example, give us a distinct sense of who they are, especially contrasted with the apartment Roderick lives in as a young man and his luxurious mansion after he becomes CEO of Fortunato. And of course, Fortunato is named for one of the characters in the cask of Amontillado. They also hide little ghosts around in the sets that add to the sense that everything is haunted. The way the story uses names, concepts, and lines lifted directly from Poe's stories and poetry adds to the contrast between the modern and archaic that runs through the written and visual elements of the series, giving it a sense of being out of time and otherworldly. They were young. They only knew appetite, and here you said, come with me. Gorge yourselves. The cinematography is also great, as usual. They made sure to use the split diopter again to highlight empty space where a ghost would be, and it always works. It's honestly amazing how Flanagan consistently makes empty space so devastating and scary. I'm proud of her. You know where she gets that from, right? Yeah, the fall of the House of Usher really has it all. I laughed, I cried, and I got deeply invested in the story almost immediately, even though we're told from the start where many of the characters end up. Parts of the ending did still manage to surprise me, but on rewatch, the hints were always there, and the story built to it really masterfully. Every reveal from who Verna is, to what's behind the brick wall, to what happens to each of the ushers feels earned and foreshadowed, lending a sense of inevitability to the story. 
but the series certainly isn't perfect. The Fall of the House of Usher has an uneven quality to some of the writing and individual episodes that results in a bit of a tone problem. I could just blow them and... Yeah. Mostly with the comedy and the commentary. I can fly a new wall! I can fly a new lost! I can even get heads up to send me a new hammer! For example, the stuff with Roderick's wife Juno and Ligadone is clunky and felt like a Lifetime movie here and there. You know, a huge part of you is Ligadone. How could I not marry you? To the point I think I said out loud, Flanagan is usually smarter than this. There are some moments that really work. I will take three years of hell over a lifetime with you. Easy. But a lot of it just could have used another pass or two at the script, I think. Madeline's obsession with her algorithms is really rough, too. I am close, Arthur. My algorithm project is so close. Do you know what that means? I've noticed that often happens when artists try to use present-day tech jargon. It just didn't feel authentic, even with the devastating payoff. AI, artificial consciousness, virtual immortality. And to be clear, the payoff works. That element of the buildup just didn't. The commentary in general was well-intentioned, and even stuff I mostly agree with. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court does its part, tears the autonomy, rips the liberty away from women. But too on the nose, even feeling a bit preachy. We turn men into compounds and women into factories, cranking out what? An impoverished workforce there for the labor? And to spend what little they make consuming? It just doesn't really feel like part of the narrative and almost breaks the sense of atmosphere a little. It felt jarring compared to the subtlety and thoughtfulness of Flanagan's other series and even other scenes within this one. I see you now. I look at you and I see the poverty of you. The story overall has a bit of a disjointed feel. Some of the episodes work so much better than others, and again, when it's good, it really is amazing. But sometimes it feels like it's in a whole different world than Bly Manor or Hill House. The very end was incredibly corny visually, even if it's somewhat accurate to the short story, and it just felt really abrupt after so much buildup. I hated the stuff with Mori. I won't detail it, but it felt so gratuitous, like literal nightmare fuel and very upsetting to watch. I wasn't prepared, and I fast-forwarded through most of her scenes on rewatch because I just can not. I also didn't like how they handled Vic. It gave off very weird vibes, and it felt needlessly brutal. Also, one of the visuals looked like an actual department store mannequin, and I can't tell whether it's a mercy or not that it looked so bad, but either way, I just didn't really like it. There's also a problem with a lot of the horror visuals in general. While the overall look of the series is gorgeous and well-crafted, most of the scary visuals look cheap and cheesy when I've come to expect more immersive and visceral stuff from Flanagan's work. Although I suspect it's actually Netflix's fault since they don't want to pay anyone. There were some scenes with great visuals up to the standard I expected, but others that just made me laugh out loud. I almost wonder if the production team was miffed at Netflix and maybe just phoned it in a bit with some parts, or if it was just experimentation with inconsistent results. But despite its issues, there are a lot of scenes that are genuinely moving or tense. We've almost got her. Or scary. But you shouldn't be here. And you don't have to be here. That's all I was saying. And others that are gut-wrenching and heartbreaking and insightful. You're so out of touch with your human side. You can't even listen to anything outside your own head. It really is some of Flanagan's best work. It's just that at its worst, it does feel like a B-movie. The way the writers take inspiration from Poe's various works, mixing and matching themes and elements and building on them is really effective. I'll quickly give some thoughts on each episode, but I won't be digging into the plot too much here. The middle six episodes each focus on one of the Usher children, and they're bookended by the first and last episode, which set up and wrap up the story respectively and focus more on Roderick and, to an extent, on Madeline. A Midnight Dreary is an artful setup with a great sense of dread and foreboding, but also grandeur. And the fever called living is conquered at last. Beside it's dripping with gilded and gothic aesthetics. We meet all the Usher children. I particularly enjoy Camille, Perry, and Tamerlane. We see their dysfunctional relationships, despite how accomplished they all are. It lays the groundwork beautifully with tons of intrigue. And the reason why this trial is going to have a different outcome you're going to hear from one of them. 
an informant from within the inner circle. There are threats. Out of the will, on the streets. Neutralized, like dead. There are bounties. To the lucky usher who figures out who's talking to the feds. 50 million cash, no strings. It's definitely one of the stronger episodes and features one of the scariest scenes Flanagan has ever done, in my opinion. Drawing inspiration from Poe's stories, The Premature Burial and Morella during a terrifying flashback. Like, that scene alone might actually give me nightmares. <laughs> the second episode, The Mask of the Red Death, struggles with tone. It's Prospero, aka Perry's story, but overall it is still one of the stronger episodes and has some of the funniest scenes. The stuff with Freddy, Arthur, Prospero, and some regulatory attorneys is gold. Holy shit, we own all of these? Are you acknowledging ownership? Of course he isn't. It's perfect for this idea I <laughs> can, had. Can I talk to you for a moment? Debauchery. Can I talk? You could be invited. And gives us so many great moments. And the last thing he fucking needs is Gucci Caligula handing over the keys to the store. I also love the exchange with Perry and Verna, for example. Her appearances are a highlight of every episode, this one included. Nearly realized he's the sweetest. It's better, I promise. In the moment, just before. The general premise of the episode is that Prospero throws a hedonistic party at a Fortunato building that is supposed to be demolished. The episode ends with a truly grotesque visual that I will not be showing, although it is probably where the entire special effects budget went. And we find out it's Roderick's fault in more ways than one. This is one of the episodes that does follow the story it's based on a little bit more faithfully. For example, it features a red-cloaked figure, a hedonistic party, and a prince named Prospero trying to insulate themselves from others with the privilege of wealth. But it also diverges and modernizes to suit the overall story a bit better. We also get some other sneaky Poe references, like this one, to the ship in the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Grandpa's gonna love it. Oh, you should name it the Grampus. The Grampus. That's what I used to call him, right? Yeah. Murder in the Rue Morgue is Camille's episode. She and Tammy both have peculiar intimacy issues that they deal with in fascinating and messed up ways. I require a lot of my assistance. Despite Camille generally being a terrible person, she's so funny and cutthroat. Then what comparison are you making Boom. between accidental overdoses and last night's tragic events? And that is why I love Fox. Send the prosecutor an edible arrangement. He just bought us a couple more days of good win. I love her. Actually want me to send him an edible arrangement? I can't tell. Toby, damn it, everybody knows that edible arrangements are what you send to people you hate. So yes. Kate Siegel is a blast as the ruthless head of the Usher spin machine. She's a Varys-like character, always digging up dirt on someone. Get me Vic's file, and Juno's. And she has mysterious beef with her sister Vic. You're still thinking Victorine's the informant? Maybe. It could be Perry, little psycho. Man, what did she do to you? I'm sorry, what was that? And is always looking for anything to take her down, including rumors about her clinical trial. No, but there's something that stinks about Vic's clinical trial. Then can you poke at that? Talk to lab types, bribe, threaten, mix and match. Because she knows something's fishy. We get some excellent stuff with Camille and Verna including some more upsetting animal facts. You know how many animals are used for testing in a year? More than a hundred million. This episode borrows some elements from the story it's named for, but mostly does its own thing, which is for the best because that particular story is very silly. Some details included are the involvement of a primate and Camille Laspania's name. There's this little reference as well. And we also get Roderick reciting Annabelle Lee to Annabelle. And we loved with a love that was more than a love. I Next is The Black Cat, Leo's episode. Rahul Kohli plays a video game producer with commitment issues and violent tendencies toward his boyfriend's cat. The groundwork for this episode was mostly laid in Camille's episode and borrows a lot from the story that it's named after, although it diverges in some merciful ways. Like the others, Leo encounters Verna, who's in tip-top form with her animal facts. Cats are predators. It's in their genes. Domesticated 10,000 years ago, but that prey drive? As usual. They leave little gifts, usually to teach you how to hunt. It's harmless. Unless you're a mouse. But I'm into it. What I'm not into is the absurd ending and generally goofy tone that feels like it's in a different show than the last three episodes we just watched. It is unfortunately the worst of the bunch, despite having some great moments. Hey, I was hoping for some drugs. 
it just didn't have the impact I expected, and the buildup was interesting, so I was expecting more of an effective payoff. It's also one of the episodes that deals most heavily with themes of guilt and denial, and kind of mirrors Vic's episode Telltale Heart in some ways, so it's unfortunate that it's so weak compared to the others. I will offer one other little spoiler here and say that Mike Flanagan clarified online that within the narrative, no cats were harmed. It's all in Leo's head. That cat is okay. Telltale Heart is Vic's episode. Tania Miller does her best with very uneven writing for Vic. She's a wonderful actress, so I can't blame her for what doesn't work, but I didn't like this episode. On paper, it should be one of my favorites. Telltale Heart is a Poe classic, and the episode borrows a lot from it. But the visuals and rushed ending just didn't hit the way I think they wanted it to. It also has central themes of guilt and denial and mirror both Leo and Roderick's story, so I was hoping for it to really deliver, but it just kind of felt like it floundered a bit, especially towards the end. I also have complicated feelings about the choices they made with the writing for Vic and her partner, particularly with them being the only lesbian pairing in the show. I knew what kind of show I was getting into, I understand that it is horror and things are gonna happen, but their story felt just particularly nasty when compared to some of the others. That said, we do get a heartbreaking, I can fix it, from her. I'm so sorry, I just... I can fix it. No, no. <laughs> Which is one of those little recurring lines that Mike Flanagan likes to slip into his series. She also gives us some of the most brutally emotional scenes in terms of just how hard they are to watch. They're not body horror in the way that the stuff with Maury is, but they are almost exactly as painful to watch. Like, this guts me. I love... I will give you anything you want. Just name your price. It's at its most tragic when we see how empty Victorine is and how desperate she is for her father's approval. The scenes between her and Roderick are some of the best in the episode. I am not strong. I am... I am not brave. Until he goes to investigate the mysterious sound, then it's all downhill from there. And don't get me wrong, parts of it were built up and foreshadowed really masterfully. The only people out for Usher blood are ashes. I was just expecting them to go a different direction with it, and I didn't love where they ended up. In Goldbug, we see poor Tamerlane go off the rails as she isolates herself to avoid dealing with everything going on with her family, while still trying to launch her Goldbug subscription service. It's one of my favorite episodes. Tammy's fascinating, and her husband Bill is just a little cinnamon roll who really loves his wife, even though she's just... so weird? Tamara Lane's tragedy lies in how much of her misery is her own doing. She's haunted by herself, sort of like Henry is in The Jolly Corner in Bly Manor. Her episode doesn't take too much inspiration from the story it's named for, beyond incorporating some imagery and name dropping. It takes its inspiration from Poe's story William Wilson instead. And it is one of the more effective episodes, although it still has some moments that feel a bit off. <laughs> It's also great that we finally get a bit more of Pym's backstory with references to the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. I like to think he killed someone. I like to think he's eaten human flesh. I like to think he took a piss on the tip top of the world. It's some good stuff, although I do have some questions about the actual story it's based on because there are elements that don't age great. He told Tammy the earth was hollow and that he found an island at the top of the world that he called Ultima Thule. The Pit and the Pendulum is Freddy's story. Freddy is pure evil, and this episode and everything building up to it was upsetting. I can't even deal with the stuff between him and his wife, Maury. But I also feel really bad for his daughter, Lenore, because she is a sweet girl who hasn't hurt anybody and basically just tries her best to be a good person despite the family she was born into. But the ending of the episode is still really satisfying, and Freddy's encounter with Verna is one of my favorite scenes. I loved Carla Gugino's delivery so much in this show, and it's just great here. The episode takes some inspiration from the story The Pit and the Pendulum, and some of the grisly stuff comes from Bernice. Berenice? I always read it as Berenice. We also get a meeting between Madeline and Verna in this episode, and a recitation of the poem The City in the Sea. Lying alone, far down within the dim west where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. It's great, and I love that Madeline tries to negotiate with her. Mm, there's my Cleopatra. Everything has a price. We can sort this. 
And finally, we tie it all together with The Raven. Parts of this episode are fantastic, like finding out what's behind the brick wall, who Verna is, and why she seems to be stalking the Usher family, the truth of the New Year's party, and why the events of the series really are Roderick and Madeline's fault in a very direct way. The main storylines are all resolved, and we finally understand the real price of the choices Roderick has made. It incorporates the ending of the story it's based on, and elements from some words with a mummy, and of course the cask of Amontillado. I still really enjoyed the episode, but the end felt very rushed, and the visuals are comically bad, although I do like that parts of it mirror the first episode. It's fairly faithful to the story, and I know they had to wrap it up, I just wish they'd given it a little bit more time. It's still a satisfying conclusion overall, and the payoff in the 70s timeline was... fantastic. There were also some truly heart-rending moments in the near present that left me ugly crying like a baby. Like, crying so much I got a little bit dehydrated. And they included some lines from The Raven to <laughs> devastating effect. And The Raven, never flitting, still is sitting. Still sitting on the pallid bust of the palace, just above my chamber door. Also, I love that they actually incorporated a bust for The Raven to sit on. Overall, it does serve well as a modern, gothic, Edgar Allan Poe mixtape. I just wish they'd committed to a more serious tone, or given some of the comedy and commentary a bit more finesse. When compared to Hill House, or Bly Manor, or even The Midnight Club, which is unfairly maligned, it doesn't have quite as consistent a sense of atmosphere. And it lacks the slow burn and incredible crescendo of an ending of Midnight Mass. But what it does have are tons of interesting characters with fascinating relationship dynamics, thoughtful recurring themes of guilt, denial, and manipulation, wonderful use of Poe's writing, a great sense of humor, gorgeous cinematography and lighting, and I think the most fun of any of Flanagan's series. The nature of each episode telling its own story keeps things fresh, provides variety, and leaves room for creativity and experimentation. The more I watch it, the more I like it and notice new details, even if it isn't my favorite entry in the Flaniverse overall. This was the last of the horror series Mike Flanagan will be making for Netflix, but once the studios pay the actors what they're worth and things get back on track, I am so excited to see what he does next under his new contract, even if it's with Prime. But that's just my opinion. What did you think about the fall of the House of Usher? Who was your favorite character? Which was your favorite story? And what Poe references did I miss? Let me know in the comments down below. I have a lot more to say about this show, and I'm working on a detailed breakdown, but it was getting to be way too long, so I decided to get some initial thoughts out of the way to keep it from getting out of control, and to keep you guys from having to wait too long in the meantime. Like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Peter Zane. Okay, also note, my earrings are little gold bugs. Ah, ah.